all started in the 60s when in the first of a series of campus killings, a student started firing from the tire of the university in Austin, Texas, killing 16 people in 80 minutes. Then a 15-year-old fires away at his classmates in Oregon. Twelve students and a teacher die from a mass killing by two teenagers in Middleton, Colorado. Criminologists are already speaking of the age of mass killings, and campus shootings are only one variety, if the most incomprehensible, of this plague. Santana High School near San Diego, March 2001. A 15-year-old kills two, wounds 13. As usual, the explanations looked for are social isolation, self-alienation, easy access to firearms. And, as always, the real reason remains a mystery. Here, the campus of Simons Rock College in Massachusetts. An 18-year-old student from Taiwan, Wayne Lo, runs along the road, kills two, wounds four. Simons Rock, until then, is considered one of the best colleges in the United States. The dead victims, on the upper left, Professor Sayers, on the right, classmate Galen Gibson, also 18, just like the killer. After his arrest, Wayne claims that God had ordered him to commit the murders. The parents, newly immigrated, father was a major in the Taiwanese Air Force, feel helpless. They don't recognize their son, who so far had shown no interests beyond work, learning, sports and music. An exemplary family, all set for assimilation into the mainstream. They live out west in Billings, Montana. Wayne grew up a Catholic. He was never very religious until on the campus he received the divine message to kill. His parents still live in Montana. This is Wayne's former Catholic high school. Why did it happen? You mean Wayne's incident? I don't know. I don't I, think we I can know. explain that. I, until now, I, I ask God every night. I would never have answered. Did God have anything to do with it? I don't know. Wayne Lowe has now served seven years of his life sentence in this prison. And it appears that for many years he never reflected on his crime, as if someone else had committed it, someone who just happened to be called Wayne Lowe. I ask him, how could you do that? How could you do that? Why did you do that? He said, Mom, that was not me. And I was crying all, all the way through. I couldn't say too much to him. And uh, I, I was, I didn't know how to, how to handle this. Wayne, we are told, has adapted well to prison routine. Apparently, he feels almost happy, like someone who is finally rid of all psychological pressure, this heavy feeling of compulsion that appears to be at the bottom of most of these mass murders. So I flew to uh, that area and got a chance to, to see Wayne. So we discussed, so I say, how could you do this? How could you believe this is God wants you to do it? He said, Dad, because he's inside me. He wanted me to do it. He's inside me. I know so. So what, what can I say? Playing the Wayne is not only an excellent musician, but also a sports lover. He takes care of his brother, helps out his father. And all this time, there must have been something in him that finally brought him to this place. And now, the greatest riddle of all. Can a psychotic actually heal himself without drugs, without psychiatric help? as seems to be the case here. 
Or is this intelligent kid still as insane as when he bought the weapon? When? What did he need a gun for? Well, I've always enjoyed guns. Um, my, my father being in the military, I was exposed to weapons at a young age, basically. I, he never had a gun at home. We never had a gun at home of any type. But, uh, of course, being in Billings, Montana, it's a big, uh, out west is the gun. People are very, people love guns, basically. They go hunting, all my friends had guns and whatnot. Treasures of a weapons collector. Being that I was turning 18, it's sort of in America sort of like a rite of passage when you turn that age that either your parents will buy you a gun or you'll buy yourself a gun. You know? His semi-automatic rifle Wayne got without trouble at a shop for sporting goods. The ammunition he ordered by mail. Chinese are considered among the most peaceful immigrants to America, not to say the most ambitious. Like all Chinese children, Wayne Lo is forced to learn about discipline and has to suppress his emotions. In college, he is considered a conservative, yes, maybe even a member of the religious right. In Billings, the Lowe's open up. What else? A Chinese restaurant. It's an immediate success, providing work for the whole family. Wayne, now entering puberty, has little opportunity to let go. Once he runs away from home with his mother's car, but is back soon. It's his last attempt to escape to freedom. Did your son Wayne actually like being here? Uh, well, not really. <laughs> not really. Asians always want to be number one. Well, he's my oldest son. Yeah, traditionally, you know, if he's the oldest son, uh, parents usually expect more. That's true. In high school, Wayne is such a good student that he is beginning to get bored. Also, he seems resentful of blacks, homosexuals and AIDS victims. This proud boy has trouble making friends. We always have a good dream, say, we have better education here. We can provide our children better life. And this is a brochure I tell you, if you are a intelligent students in high school, you feel bored, you should go to this college. And we cut that returning post uh, card type things. We send it back, ask for more information. That was the start. And I, many times I, I blame myself. Was that? That was a wrong, wrong thing I did. I should not send him to the school. But you couldn't have known. No. A coffee shop in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, where the college is located. They didn't show much eagerness to receive us or give us any information. Sharon Flitterman King. A former teacher. He was a young person who was confused, I think, about his identity. He had come over from Taiwan when he was five. Uh, he lived in Montana. I think the campus, which is a very beautiful campus, 
has very gifted and very um, individual kids that do their own thing. I think, you know, they do the earrings and the piercing and all of that. I think he couldn't find his place there. And I think he began to push, to push his limits. Did you feel isolated in that school? Yeah, I, in, in, in a way I was. In a way I was because I was, first of all, I mean, there were very few minorities to begin with, blacks, Asians, whatever. It was mostly white kids at that school. There's supposed to have been a lot of homosexuals. Uh, yeah, yeah, there were. Are you? No. The old courthouse in Great Barrington. One of Wayne's defense attorneys was Stuart Eisenberg, now a professor of law. In your opinion, why did Wayne suddenly run amok? Um, I've asked myself that question so many times that I'm not sure which answer is appropriate. Um, in my opinion, uh, Wayne had, um, look at who Wayne Lowe was. Wayne Lowe was an extremely accomplished young scholar, a writer. As a music musician, he was one of the best in the world in his age group. Um, he prided himself in his athletics. Every single day he would practice his instrument for an hour and a half. He would uh, do his homework to an A level. He would work in the family Chinese restaurant 10 hours a week. While his parents were hard at work, he would be taking care of his younger brother, feeding him, making sure that he did his homework. Um, Wayne had pressures that I think are um, unreasonable to expect a young person to be able to comply with. And in arguing that to the jury, the reason that it happened is there was some pressures that came together that made Wayne look for answers in other places. And it resulted in a mental defect, which is a mental disease, I should say, a delusion. And uh, he followed that voice and did what the voice instructed him to do. What I conclude from the materials that I have read he was diagnosed bipolar. What I believe is that he was swinging back and forth like a pendulum. Chaos theory says that. The swings get wider and wider and wider. I believe that as a young man, without a firm sense of self, without an identity, he could not control these things. I believe that there was a vacuum inside that enabled him to, they would say, flip out. So in that sense, yes, I do think, I do think, that his, um, cycle, his psyche had exploded. That's how I would describe it. I'm not a psychiatrist. Approximately 10 days before the shooting occurred, I was, um, I was in my dorm room and um, I got a feeling. Now, it's not a voice, it's not a vision, nothing like that. The best way I can explain that is I don't know if you ever had the feeling of uh, deja vu when you're traveling somewhere and all of a sudden you feel as if you've been here before. Well, this feeling told me to read the book of Revelation in the Bible. And now this boy Far from his parents and his country of birth, estranged from others and perhaps from himself, doubting his personal and probably sexual identity, here is a message, voices, to whom he owes obedience, as once did Joan of Arc. He reads the Bible, the book of Revelations. He believes it is addressed to him. Here's the sword of revenge on those who fail the Lord. I began reading the book. And um, I began reading about it because I went to Catholic high school and we all had a Bible. And the thing was with the Bible was back in Catholic school, I was kind of rebellious in my classes. And we had religion class. And what I did back in Catholic high school was I took tape and wrapped it around my Bible because as a sign of defiance of I didn't want to read it because I was really against everything they said. 
And when I had this feeling, I had to cut the Bible open because it remained sealed. So when I opened the Bible and started reading the book of Revelation, I started seeing things in the text and I felt that it pertained to me. Um, like what? Well, right now it seems, now that I look back at it, it seems kind of weird that I would even think like that. But at that time, it felt pretty real to me when I read these things. Like, uh, they talk about the opening of seals and whatnot, and I took that as a sign as I unsealed my Bible. I felt that was an act that was in the, in the book. And basically the book was about apocalyptic uh, events that will occur in the future. And um, there were specific events such as horsemen coming down, bringing famine and destruction and war to the earth, and to destroy all the sins on the earth. And I felt that that was my mission to destroy the sins at Simon's Rock. He ordered 200 rounds of ammunition in the mail. I think he believed that if he was supposed to do what he was supposed to do, no one would intercept that ammunition. When the ammunition arrived in his mailbox and the authorities were told that it was clearly marked 200 rounds of ammunition and the authorities said deliver it to Wayne, I think in his very confused mind he took that as a go-ahead when nobody stopped him, when they delivered the ammunition because they didn't want to violate his rights. What did you feel about that gun and that ammunition? Well, I, I received the ammunition first. That yes. was on a Monday morning, I believe, I received the ammunition. And in the afternoon, I went to a nearby town to purchase the gun, that afternoon. After I purchased the gun, I came back. I went to a final, an English final, I completed that, and um, I had the gun. I had the gun, had the ammunition. But still, at that time, I wasn't really sure if anything was going to happen, if it was going to happen, if I was going to go out and shoot people. I didn't know. I just made the preparation for whatever that was about to happen. And then what, what set it off? What set the shooting? What set it off? Well, that evening, Monday evening, everything was normal. I went to dinner. I came back, I did my laundry, I believe. Um, there was a house meeting, the dorm meeting, a dorm meeting of the people in the dorm. I went to that, and I would say uh, perhaps around, I think, I would say somewhere around 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, I got the same, similar feeling. However, this, this feeling, the message that I received from this feeling was not to read the revelation, but it basically said, it is time. Did you talk to your son just before it happened, Lindlin? Um, ten days before it happened, Ryan and me, we went to visit him. And uh, we had a dinner and we together and we stayed in the hotel together and uh, we had breakfast together. And nothing shows. And he was he was the boy I have just what to me if he has something different I would I can tell I'm the mother but 10 days before that I I, I didn't see anything it is a sign it was different so I I don't know. I went out of my dorm through the door that led to a big grassy area in the back of the school. I walked across that path and the first thing I saw was a security guard. I shot her and then a car drove up and I shot at the car. I didn't know who was in the car. It was only afterwards that I, knew, I found out it was a professor, Professor uh, Saez. Um, when I was close to the library, a car drove up. I tried to shoot at the car, but the gun 
malfunctioned. And then I got it to work again, and then somebody ran out from the library, and I shot that person. Later I found out it was Galen Gibson. And then I moved on towards the dorms. I shot at people in the dorms. Um, again, I couldn't see who they were. And later I learned I injured two people there as well. After I shot at those people at the dorms, again, I got this feeling again. And it basically said, it is done. I took that as saying that it was time to stop. So I stopped. There was a kid standing there when, by the time Wayne got into the student lounge. And the kid goes, Wayne, what are you doing? And Wayne goes, um, beep, shooting people. Beep, shooting people. And the kid goes, don't shoot, don't shoot. And Wayne says to the kid, call 911. So the kid is shaking. There is no 911 in the area. So Wayne says, OK. He picks up the telephone, and he calls the police. Now, I would not say he wanted to be punished. I would say he was sick of what he was doing, that, that he was confused and miserable, and he wanted it to, to be over. He's, he's not a violent child. Did you want to get caught? Um, I didn't think about getting caught or anything like that. It just felt I'd finished my mission, and now that this has happened, I mean, the logical thing was to call the police. Did you feel you wanted to be punished for what you had done? I, I don't think so, because I didn't think at that point I did anything wrong, so why should I be punished? In the courtroom, Wayne instructed his lawyers not to plead insanity, but to examine how far the victims themselves deserve to be punished. It is true that Wayne never agreed um, to our characterization of his having suffered from a mental disease. Um, and it is true that he felt God must have had a purpose in choosing these particular victims um, to die. Would that be a sign of insanity? Um, insanity is a big word. Um, he was found by our experts to have been suffering from a delusional disorder. A delusion is a fixed false belief, and his fixed false belief was that a voice came to him and told him um, to read revelations and do what had to be done, and that's what he did. He was unshakable in that belief. Did you recognize your son when you went to see him after the shooting? Was that the man you had seen two weeks before? No. It's a totally different person. He, he just, just come. We he was a kind, just a body. I, I can, I don't know how to describe a good English word. Just a, have a body. There's no, no soul. His eyes was just, he would look at things like that. Kind of, just empty. You instructed your attorneys to examine the lives of your victims because you felt somehow that they were preordained to be your victims. Correct, correct. That's what I felt at that time, back then, because my attorneys were trying to base the defense on me being under a psychotic delusion and whatnot. But of course, personally, I felt that at that time I did the right thing. And to prove that, I wanted them to check the lives of those victims and to see if they, in fact, they were the ones who did something wrong and led them to be punished by me. It was their fault. At that point, yes. And I this thought, was their punishment. That's what I felt. That's what I felt at that time. The jury had sat through, I don't remember, five or six weeks of trial. And um, after four and a half days, came back with a unanimous verdict that he was, in fact, criminally responsible for his act. No, to this day, I don't agree with the jury. I asked him one question I remember very clear. I said, Wayne, 
If I am standing in front of you, are you going to shoot me? He said, I don't know. The port of Gloucester on the Atlantic coast, where the young victim Galen grew up in a very close family. His father, Gregory, sells books on the sea. Gregory Gibson, could you understand right away what had happened? I understood that my son had been murdered. I didn't want to understand it, but I think in my heart, I, people don't joke about this. I think I understood, yes, that my son was dead. What that meant, what that would come to mean, and, and all the things associated with it would take years uh, to understand. Yeah. Yeah. Here he is getting paint, his face painted. This is when he was younger, maybe 16. Uh, and here he is taking pictures of you, taking pictures of him. That's good, isn't it? This is when we were all much younger and all still alive. Now there's Galen right there. Anne-Marie, Celia, Brooks, my tree. Galen in college. Uh, there's Galen and his sister. Galen and his long hair. Most of these date from college time. Was he happy in college? He loved college. He loved Simon's Rock. Uh, until he got killed, it was the, uh, it was the happiest. Uh, <laughs> there he is being happy. Uh, he was interested in the theater, and he is, uh, did a lot of uh, stage uh, acting or, or, or uh, technical work on the stage. Did you ever think it was possible to have a murder on that college? Well, no, it's not the thing you think of when you send your child to college, is it? A college seems like a very safe place. And a college library, I can't imagine anything seeming safer. So in a way, it's just uh, a, a perfect example of how unexpected things can be in this life. He actually was killed saving another student. Yeah, someone had um, come into the library and said there's been an accident down the street. Um, they didn't understand that, uh, that the shooting had taken place. And uh, a girl started to go out and um, uh, Galen said, no, you, you wait here, I'll go, I'll go help. And as he was going out the door, Wayne, who was waiting on the, um, on the sidewalk, then um, shot him at the door of the library where he was. I didn't even think about the victims because when I went to court, I was the defendant. I had to defend against accusations from others. So in a weird way, I felt I was the victim instead of those that I hurt. So what happened was I completely removed them. They didn't feel like human beings to me at that point at the trial because I was the one trying to defend myself. And I, did, I wanted to do everything I could to defend myself because I felt I was in the right. So for all these years, until 1999, they didn't even seem like people to me. You see them, call them victims. I mean, what are they? I mean, victims, it was just a word. It didn't have a name attached to it. I mean, it had a name and a face, but I didn't know that name and a face. And I didn't give any thought to them. Galen's tombstone in Gloucester, with his father sitting on it. He spent six long years furiously researching his son's death. And finally, in his little bookshop, he wrote the book Gone Boy, which was a kind of lifesaver for him, a process of healing. You then started out on a, on a voyage, on an odyssey of many years, researching your son's death. Uh, and who was all possibly to blame for that. And you're still on this voyage now, aren't you? Well, I don't think when one embarks on a voyage like that, one ever finishes. This is, my life has changed. Our, our lives, everyone in our family has changed radically by this terrible event. So we will all be on voyages of one kind or another, but perhaps all that means is that our lives are now taking a different course than they would have if Galen hadn't have been killed. 
going mad and shooting people. It seems to be an American specialty. Well, the first is uh, if they have the tool. If you don't have a gun in your hand, what can you do? Right? Some people said, okay, nothing wrong with the gun. It's, it's the one holding the gun. So, who should hold in the gun? A gun shop in Billings, Montana, where young Wayne grew up. Apart from having to pay for it, what else do you need in order to buy a weapon? For handguns, then uh, the easiest ways to be a resident are the state that you're in. Like for Montana, then it's easiest to be a resident in the state of Montana. And then you fill out what they call a 4473 NICS check, which is a federal background check to see if you have any criminal offenses against you, anything like that. And if that goes through there, you pay for it and walk out that day. There are actually more guns than citizens in the United States. Uh, strange but true, yeah. <laughs> I don't know the reason. 2,000 firearms being produced every hour in this country, is that possible? Violent films and video games are now definitely considered a threat to young people. Murders are often committed in imitation. It was just such a semi-automatic rifle that Wayne used for his murderous attack. A law aimed at this kind of weapon has never had a chance against the powerful gun lobby. Whether it's more dangerous, however, to rein in explicit representation as in pornography or to let it all out is still a subject of fierce debate. My understanding is there have been 41 campus shootings since 1968, since the one in Austin, Texas, in the tower. Um, if I could answer that question, sir, I would share the secret with the rest of the world. Um, I think that America is a pluralist society. It's very diverse. Um, um, because we lack homogeneity, uh, sometimes culturally we lack the ability to understand each other. And uh, I think people are privatized and isolated in their lives, in, especially in modern America, um, which is fast-paced and impersonal. And, and um, people develop uh, sociopathy, which is a fancy word we use for an inability to, to relate to others in society. And, and um, the result sometimes is violent acts. It's a natural, it's a part of our biology. Um, what we've done, the splendid advance that we've made, is to find that um, we can make money trading on this unfortunate aspect of our natures. And that it's very satisfying to shoot imaginary bad guys. It's quite fun. Um, so it's, now it's just commerce. Do you ever go watch uh, Rambo movies or things like that? Yeah, yeah I'm, just as, I'm just as bad as anyone else. Are we all fascinated by, by the shadow, by the darkness in ourselves? I think, I think we are, sure. sure. As much as we'd like to eliminate this, I think it's an um, undeniable fascination to us all. Did you ever dream of shooting some arms dealers or maybe Wayne Lowe? Many times. Um, I, I like the punch myself. Wayne Law, maybe I'd shoot. The rest, I'd just punch. Uh, as a, just a, a fantasy. Would he have shot at people in Taiwan, do you think, Lin Lin? No. No. I, I, that's a good question, but I can tell you no. Back in 1999, when I first found out the book came out, um, I had my parents send me a copy, and I began reading. 
and I guess the funny thing about that time was because um, I'm a very big baseball fan. I don't know if you know a lot about baseball, but at that time around September, October is when the playoffs began. And the amount of energy I put into that. Watching, watching television, television here. Watching baseball on TV. Here. And here. And then reading, started to read Mr. Gibson's book. And I read of Galen's life growing up with his parents and I see I found there's so many similarities between his family and my family myself he had a brother and a sister I had a brother he had a m mother and father who loved him very much just like my family and for the first time I, I actually began to realize that he's wasn't much different than myself and I ended his life I took everything away from him I not only took everything away from him he ever had, I took everything that he ever would have. He, who knows, maybe he was a Yankees fan. Maybe he would like to enjoy watching the games on TV like I was, of all the energy I was devoting to that. And it just felt completely absurd that I could invest so much energy watching a baseball game while I'm paying absolutely no attention to something as serious as killing someone. And the amount of emotion that I exhibit after, let's say, a loss and the de dejection that I have after a loss by my team, how exponentially more was that dejection felt by Mr. Gibson, his family, and everybody else, every other victim of my crime, you know what I mean? And their families. That, they're not watching a game. This is their son they lost. So he's beginning to know that he did wrong, which yes. he didn't know before. Right. Yes. So we f we feel uh, good about that part because uh, you know he did something wrong, but if he keeps thinking he's right, then you know that's that's no good. But he is thinking he. He should apologize at least first because even he cannot understand the whole thing. But he should do that way. It's I always think it's right. Wayne Lowe, after years in prison, suddenly started writing to you. What did he say? He came to realize, I think, that he wasn't uh, on a mission from God and that he had committed an enormous, horrible crime, that he'd caused many people a great deal of pain. And he wanted to acknowledge to me his awareness of this. And he succeeded in doing that. Did you ask his forgiveness? No, absolutely not. That was one thing I made very clear. I said, I, I, I'm not here. My reason for writing you was not to, for you to forgive me for what I have done, because what I have done does not deserve forgiveness from him. What I've taken from him is, is, will never be replaced. I can, there's nothing I can do to replace what I did already. How did your family feel about all this obsessive research to write your book? Oh, they thought I was crazy. Yeah. Did you get the sound of things? Yeah, sure. What did you think about when I was out there doing it? Um, <laughs> I don't care. I don't know. I was young. Yeah? But I thought you were not. Have you read the book? No. Nope. I'm holding out for Oprah. Until Dad gets on Oprah, I'm not going to read it. Oprah, the big uh, television show. Yes. <laughs> you didn't approve of your dad writing it? I approved of it. I thought that that was the best way for him to heal himself. And I know he's gained a lot from it, but I don't, I don't want to go through that again myself. I'd rather not read it. I don't. I lived it. That's my girl. <laughs> you yourself have gone and visited the Gibson family, haven't you? Yes, we yes. did. Yes. Yes. What made you do that? Uh, we are all human beings, right? When uh, 
did that and uh, we know uh, we don't know Mr. Gibson at all before that but we think we should go to him to to talk to him what we feel about everything Mr. and Mrs. Gibson they are very special person they have big heart We really appreciate they allowed us to visit them. Do you think it ever will become clear to you, quite clear to you, why you did it? That's a hope that I would, in fact, one day find out somehow. Um, like I said, all of a sudden I was able to find out how devastating my actions were. So maybe perhaps down the road, one day I'll come to realize why I did it. And of course that's a search everybody is looking looking at, everybody is searching for, and I myself is searching for it. Because I would like to know why I did what I did. Because what I did was, there's nothing more horrible than what I did. What is wrong with our children is a question asked today by many parents in America and in other countries where the sight of young people running amok is also becoming more frequent. Is it perhaps the absence of any clear motivation for the killings that is so worrying? Maybe the kids are just reacting more violently to things grown-ups are merely frustrated or depressed about. Is mass killing just a symptom of something in society which is fundamentally going wrong? One of the things we all have to learn sooner or later is how to deal with tragedy. Yeah, unfortunately, I think it's something that everybody has to learn whether they want to or not. Do you think you're helping others to survive through your example? I would be very happy if that were the case. I can only, I, I can hope, I can hope that it helps someone, somewhere, somehow. <laughs> 